thank you very much. Thank you for the invitation to be here um, on a cold night. Um, yes, yeah, so I'm a little bit different from some of the other people who might have been here um, giving presentations previously insofar as I'm a pathologist. I am a doctor. Uh, we are doctors, pathologists. Um, and you can have lots of different types of doctors. Um, and you can all represent them by various aspects of the um, caduceus. I like the gastroenterologist, yes. Um, the pathologist is just on the end and they, we don't get a very good rap. Um, pathologists have got a bad reputation. Um, we're considered to be blood suckers, um, which in my case isn't true because I'm not a blood doctor, I'm a tissue doctor, so there are subtypes of pathologists, so I'm not a blood sucker. I look underneath the microscope um, and say it's a mammoth or not, depending on what they're trying to make as a diagnosis. So I work with surgeons to make diagnoses, mainly in cancer and these days nearly always in prostate disease and uh, bladder and genitourinary type stuff. That's my area of interest. Uh, as I say, we do have a really, really bad rep on television. These guys aren't pathologists. These guys are actors. Actually, no, they're coppers and um, supposedly coppers and scientific officers. These guys are pathologists, but they're also actors and we don't do anything like they do, but that's closest to what I sort of get, although I don't do any autopsies anymore. But I like Silent Witness, it's a great show. Um, free advertise. Um, what we do is, what I do is I look down the microscope and I classify things. I give them a handle, a, an entity, a label, um, so that we can in fact use that information to recognise the things that don't quite fit. So what I'm trying to look do when I look down the microscope is say there's something there that's not normal, what's it doing, why is it there, what does that mean to the patient. So. Let me give an example. Finnish files the results of years of scientific, scientific study combined with experience of many years. What does that mean? Not a lot, but I want you to count the Fs in the sentence. You get a few seconds to count the Fs in the sentence. Okay, so who saw that there were three Fs in that sentence? Anyone see three Fs in the sentence? And only three Fs? Good. Anyone see four Fs in the sentence? Anyone see five Fs in the sentence? Anyone see six Fs in the sentence? Anyone see seven Fs in the sentence? Okay, there's six. Um, and the trick is the ofs. And the ofs are little bits of information that are actually quite important from the point of view of making the sentence, but once you get the information all up, you tend to delete those little bits of information and what a pathologist does is they look down the thing and they get a global picture, but they also get all the lots of little bits of information and they narrow it right down to the letters and all that sort of stuff and actually break it up and give you a really, really uh, detailed an, uh, analysis of what it is we're looking at. So we're trying to actually identify all those little bits and pieces. No, there's six. There were six last time I looked. You should have quit while you were ahead. Yep. Anyway, there's two in this one. <laughs> so is it all worth the effort, uh, what I do as a pathologist? Okay, well, let me give you a big example that's really got nothing to do with what we're doing here today, but just from the point of view of what I'm, the point I'm trying to make. Um, everyone's heard about the bubonic plague, the so-called Black Death. And the Black Death hit Constantinople in 542 AD. Um, it started at the docks where the boats arrived, and uh, it lasted for multiple waves in which thousands and thousands and eventually millions of people died. Now the reason it was important in 542 was because that's when the Roman Empire was under a lot of stress. And it was actually in the process of collapsing. Uh, the headquarters of the Roman Empire was at Constantinople and the emperor at that stage uh, was Justinian. And Justinian was actually trying to rebuild the empire and push all the Mongols back. Um, and he managed to do that. So he'd got the right hand side uh, of the empire well and under control and his general Belisarius had pretty much conquered large portions of the left-hand side back again and they were really actually doing quite a good job and then the plague arrived and the plague decimated the troops, decimated the population and even um, Justinian got the plague although he didn't die from it and the result was that they didn't pull it off uh, they lost the battle and really what happened was that we had the fall of the Roman Empire not just because of the bubonic plague, but it's one of the major things that happened on it. And it partly resulted in, therefore, the establishment of the European states, the rise of the Islamic Empire came on soon afterwards, and we ended up with a template for the modern world, which if it had been different, 
would have been a different world today. So what's the thing about the pathology? Well, Yersinia pestis is the bug that causes the bubonic plague and causes the big um, swellings as people get, uh, as the organism proliferates in them. And it has a complicated mechanism of functioning. And it basically is a bug that lives in a flea that, that lives on the rat. And then the rat runs around the people and then the fleas jump off the rats and bite the people. But the bacteria itself, if you go right down and look at the pathobiology of the way the bacteria functions, what it does is actually it secretes around it outside of its organism structure a sort of biofilm or sort of glue. And what happens is that a whole bunch of the organisms then all stick together. And so you get this pathobiological formation of a disruptive uh, plug and it blocks the stomach of the flea. So the flea can't eat any normal food, so the flea gets really, really hungry. And so the flea starts to eat as much as it can and bite as much as it can. So when the Yersinia pustis is filling up the stomach of the flea, the flea's furiously, furiously biting everything. And therefore you get spread of the organism as it jumps to, from rat to rat and all that sort of stuff. What's interesting, however, is that glue is only active within a certain range of temperature, uh, only between about 15 and 20 degrees. And if it gets above that temperature, the flea, the whole of the flea, then the glue melts and the organism's passed and you don't get the flea doing its frenzied activity of biting. And so that really only the plague really only spreads in environments where the temperature is about 15 to 25 because otherwise it has little episodes and it breaks down and whatever. And so what actually happened was that we know that the plague started in the middle part of Africa. And it used to travel down the Nile with the ships and the boats that were traveling. But of course, as to do that, it has to get through the Sudan. And there's a huge desert in the middle of the Sudan. And when it gets hot, the glue would melt, the bacteria would be passed, and the, and the bacteria and the plague didn't really spread down to the top end of the Nile for quite a few years. Until around about 530 AD, when there was a period of global cooling. And the temperature of the Sudan dropped. And the temperature of the Dan rock dropped, the boats kept coming down, the rats, the fleas, and the Yersinia pestis made it all the way down the Nile, and they made it to the um, delta of the Nile, where all the trading ships used to come, from, come across from Alexandria in around about 540, where the first episodes of the plague were identified, and then in 542, it hits Constantinople. So whilst that's only a big history picture, it demonstrates that medicine, and particularly pathology, is about understanding how things go. And what we do is we label things, we document it, and it allows you to understand how, in, if you're going to look at history, big sweeping changes occur. But if you look at it in a more minutia situation or an individual situation, classification of disease, understanding of disease for clinicians and patients gives you information. So if we're going to classify prostate cancer, you can actually look at the lots and lots of different types of prostate cancer. The main one is the top left hand one uh, that we call adenocarcinoma of the prostate and it's the majority one. But I look at that and I can break that down into different subtypes and give that interpretation and give that classification plus a whole bunch of other bits of information. And why is that useful? Well, for clinicians and for the patients, it allows you to know what's the best type of treatment. It allows you to set the timing of the treatment and it allows you to give planning and prognosis information about the treatment. So if we knew about the flea, we could have said things are going to go badly as soon as the temperature changed because we understood the, biology, the pathobiology of the flea. If we know the pathobiology of prostate cancer, then we can make predictions about how it's going to behave over a period of time. So it's all about understanding and passing on information so that you and the clinicians that we work with can make the right sort of information. So a few basic definitions. Pathology, strictly speaking, is the science of the cause and effect of disease or that branch of medicine that deals with laboratory stuff. I don't really like that particular definition. But a disorder of structure or function in a human, animal or plant, that's the sort of the disease that the pathology is analysing. It's more than just the actual analysis of the thing. It's actually the actual whole environment in which the patient operates and in which the patient lives. So when we're talking about disease, is it a disorder? Is it normal? And how far does it deviate from normal? And this is what I do when I look down the microscope because I'm looking for deviations from normal to give me information about behavior deviations. So cells can vary in size and color and shape down a microscope. And the tissue that the cells make up 
will also have different appearances and different shapes over that period of time. Now, if you've got a small variation, then there's going to be a small change in the way a gland would function. So, for example, a prostate gland. If there's only a little effect going on, then it will behave in sort of a benign sort of way. It really won't change its behaviour. If you get a large variation in the cells or the actual tissue of the prostate, then you get a large variation in its behaviour. And if that damage is profound, then you can end up with malignant behaviour, with it turning into a cancer. So how do we do that when we look at cells? So, these are a bunch of terms that are used to classify cellular appearances that we use when we look down the microscope. Hyperplasia is a good one, and you would have heard that in the context of benign prostatic hypertrophy or benign prostatic hyperplasia, which is swelling of the prostate. Now, strictly speaking, swelling of the prostate is actually a hyperplasia where you get one cell on the left-hand side, little puppy dog, turns into multiple cells. You have an increased numbers of cells that are actually making up the gland, so the gland gets bigger. It's not actually, strictly speaking, hypertrophy whilst the gland gets bigger. Hypertrophy in pathology terms and medical terms means the actual puppy dog gets much bigger. So it turns from a schnauzer into a German shepherd or some sort of huge dog, but it doesn't do that. Um, so hypertrophy and hyperplasia are those size changes that we talk about where things are getting bigger. And atrophy is where it shrinks. So you start off with a normal type thing and then it shrinks back down. And part of the prostate is famous for doing that when it gets inflamed and you talk about, you'll see reports saying there's bits of atrophy and inflammation in the prostate because uh, the glands are actually shrinking down and becoming smaller. Now very, very occasionally cells can change. They can change what they do and they can turn into different types of cells and that's called metaplasia. And you see it going on particularly around lining cells in the stomach and sometimes in the bladder and things as well. So all those changes are pretty much the benign changes. They're not two variations from normal, but they make some sort of difference in the prostate or any sort of organ in which they occur. There's a couple of other ones though. Dysplasia is where you start to see disordered growth. And in disordered growth, the cells aren't behaving quite the way they used to. So instead of being a nice little fluffy dog, they turn into one with a big jaw that turns around and can potentially get a little bit nasty. Dysplasia in medical terms is actually a pre-malignant condition. It's the cells haven't become malignant yet, but they may in fact evolve over a period of time. And if they evolve in a period of time, they turn into a new neoplasia, which is a new growth, which is cancer, which is characterized by a whole bunch of scary dogs all overlapping on top of each other, all trying to attack you and bite your foot. So this is what we do. We look at things, we decide whether there's atrophy, hyperplasia, dysplasia or neoplasia and cancer and then we try and make predictions based upon that sort of architecture and that sort of recognition of what the change is and what the architecture is. And it's all about pattern recognition and we'll come back to that later on and I'll show you how it's done. It's really quite simple, uh, almost. Okay, so what is my role? Well, I say I'm a histopathologist. We look down the microscope and make histopathological diagnoses. Um, you can also in other aspects of pathology, you work in the clinical and diagnostic areas, uh, strictly speaking, and that's where you have hematologists and microbiologists and biochemists actually running around and uh, assessing people's biochemistry and blood films and giving treatment and stuff. We'd also do a lot of, lot of work in uh, research, and Douglas Haney Moy provides a, a lot of material, and I do a lot of work in um, prostate cancer research as well. From the point of view of the molecular and uh, from the point of view of the biochemical type stuff, I'm really not going to say much today. Um, except just to mention really PSA. Um, and the main thing to say about PSA is that whilst the numbers are important, the numbers are only important to individuals. So the range of PSA is huge and everybody's PSA is different from everybody else's. What is actually important is your PSA and how your PSA changes over time. And some person can have a PSA of 3 and have a cancer, and some person can have a PSA of 10 and have nothing but benign changes in their prostate. But if the person uh, with 10 goes to 30, then something's really happening. It's change going on. So it's all these sort of bell curves. Um, and PSA gives you interesting information, and it's critical, but it doesn't give you a diagnosis of cancer. You still need usually biopsies or something or other to make actually the diagnosis of cancer, which is where I come in. However, you can actually see PSA. Uh, we can actually do a thing called immunoperoxidase, which is a long word which I've never quite been able to spell. Um, but it basically means identifying function. 
So when I say I look down a microscope, I look at architecture, but I also can occasionally look at function. And I can do that by putting labels on the cells and seeing how those cells, what they're actually doing, what they're manufacturing. Are they making toast? Are they making jam? Are they doing whatever? And particularly down in the region of the bladder and the prostate, you can have bladder cancers and you can have prostate cancers. And one can grow into the other. The bladder cancer can grow into the prostate and the prostate cancer can grow into another, um, up into the bladder. So for example, this particular, um, can this particular piece of tissue here has two areas of cancer. There's sort of a purpley smudge area here and another purpley smudge area here. So that piece of tissue has cancer infiltrating into it, growing into it. But if you do special markers on the thing, you can see that only the right-hand side has got PSA in it, and the left-hand side doesn't have PSA. So this is prostate cancer, and this is bladder cancer. There are other, cu other clues, but this actually shows you why PSA does matter. Um, it's actually manufactured by the cancer cells, and then if cancer was to spread and PSA starts to rise again, then you can say that there's tumor cells, they're manufacturing, and we can see within the tumor cells, there's prostate cancer, there's PSA going on. So it does, it does relate to me, what I do in histopathology as well. Okay, so that's me, the prostate. Well, we all know where the prostate is, it's in blokes. And there's a few people in the room who don't have one. Um, many of the female type, they weren't born with them. Um, but guys have them all and they're tucked away down the bottom of the bladder as a little inverted pyramid. And crazily enough, the top half is called the base and the bottom half is called the apex because it's an inverted pyramid. And it sits at the base of the bladder and then the pointy bit comes down as you go down towards the bottom. Um, so that often confuses people when we're talking about uh, actually um, uh, trying to identify the proximal portion of the prostate, in other words, a bit closest to the bladder, or the distal portion a bit further down the urethra. It's also got a whole bunch of different zones, and those zones are important because they relate to different aspects of cancer, uh, and different diseases occur in different parts of the prostate. So for example, there's a, just look at this diagram on the bottom right hand side here, here if there's benign hyperplasia which is as you get older the prostate gets bigger and bigger and blocks the urine that usually occurs in the central or transitional zone which is around about here and the urethra is going down the middle so that's why it compresses the urethra and stops the urine from getting out. Cancer, a large proportion of the cancer, about 75% of the cancers, 80% of the cancers occur in this back end of it here, the peripheral zone. The trick however is that the peripheral zone comes right around the front. In some patients it comes all the way around things so you don't actually talk about posterior and anterior cancer in relation to the zones because they can both be anterior and posterior depending on the shape of the prostate. So this is actually a slice through a prostate stained to look at underneath the microscope. It's a complete slice. This would be the front end of it here. This would be the posterior aspect of it here and that would be the patient's right and that would be the patient's left. And this is the sort of normal appearance of prostate. It's got this sponge-like look, uh, fluffy glands, in sitting in uh, fibromuscular tissue, it's quite a hard gland. And notice how this area here is different from this area here. This area is all pink, and this area is still got the foamy, bubbly look appearance. So this is actually where a cancer is in that region, in the posterior or the peripheral zone of the cancer. This is the urethra in here running down the middle where the urine's coming down. So the cancers actually present actually often at the back end of the gland and that's just the bit that's in the prostate that's just in front of the rectum. Hence, they do a lot of needle biopsies through the rectum to get to the cancer because most of the cancers are at the back. Not all of them, and so we need to have to have ways to get access to the front half of the cancer, and I'm sure one day a surgeon will come and talk to you about how they do multiple different biopsies, and I spend all my time looking at them down the microscope. And that's where I sit. Um, it's my old office. I sit down there in my chair. Um, I look down the microscope and I have a couple of important things, and I don't know if you can see it very carefully. No, it's just off the screen. Um, there's a computer, a telephone, and there's a coffee cup. Uh, the coffee cup's, uh, there it is, the coffee cup's really important. Uh, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, and we look down the microscope, and we look at all these little glass slides, and they actually have sections of the bits of tissue. There's a whole laboratory at Douglas Hanny Moyer whose job it is to take a piece of tissue that a surgeon sends us and turns it into a tiny little slither of tissue stained in a certain way so that I can look at it down the microscope 
um, and actually make a diagnosis looking at those individual cells. And this is the sort of thing I look at. That's needle biopsies, and that's a transurethral resection of prostate, prostate chips. And both of them, you get bits of tissue like this that can be composed of muscle, and these are glands of cancer down towards the bottom. If we get a radical prostatectomy specimen, it comes out looking like a large, chunky piece of tissue uh, with rabbit's ears. The rabbit's ears are the seminal vesicles which sit at the back end of the prostate and then anteriorly um, there's the bladder base. So this actual photograph is looking down at a prostate from the top. So the bladder would normally sit in there and this is the back end and the seminal vesicles. Um, and we paint it all and on a normal projector that would be blue um, but it's sort of brownish on this projector but anyway. Um, so we paint it all so we can actually work out exactly where the edges of the tissue are and then we slice it into all these little pieces based upon a sort of grid to actually examine the whole piece of tissue. So that's one slice of the prostate. Well, it's like a piece of bread. Put all the slices together, get a loaf of bread. So we, we start off with a loaf of bread, we slice it into different slices, and then the slices we chop up into other smaller pieces so that they can fit onto those glass slides, and then we look down the microscope. And the whole point of looking down the microscope is to get information, to get, under get understanding, like I said, and to be able to make a prognostic indication of what we think is going to behave by this cancer. So what we do when we do that is we go through a list of things, and this is just the basic outline of the sort of things that we're trying to do when we're assessing somebody who's had a radical prostatectomy. We want to work out how big a cancer they've got. We want to give out the Gleason score, and I'll come back to that in a bit more detail later on. We want to know whether the cancer is still within the prostate, or whether it might have spread outside the prostate, that's extra prostatic extension. And if it has spread outside the prostate, has the surgeon been able to get all around it? Or is the cancer spread so far out that he hasn't been able to get around it? And so the margins of the tissue might be positive. So there's cancer still at the very edges of where they've operated. Seminal vesicle involvement means the tumor's growing up those little eerie things at the back. And lymph node metastases means that it's actually spread to different parts. Extra prostatic extension, the prostate's got a really funny sort of dodgy capsule which sort of surrounds most of it. It's not a really, really tight capsule, but for all intents and purposes, there's a sort of layer of fibromuscular tissue. And if the cancer's inside that layer, then the cancer is to large extent still localized to the prostate and there's a good chance it hasn't spread outside anywhere, so it's a localized thing. If it's outside, the chances of it spreading become much more common. And so these sections show this is cancer up here and this is the fat surrounding the, um, the prostate. And the cancer's coming down here and it's growing along in the fat out here. So the edge of the prostate was about here and now it's out in fat. So this is now cancer that's no longer localized to the prostate but has extended outside. And one of the ways it does, likes to do it, is it comes down and then it follows little cracks in the tissue. And the most common cracks in the tissue between the muscle bundles are where the nerves run and where the blood vessels run. So the cancer tends to grow along beside the nerves and you'll hear in reports that there was cancer present in the biopsies and there may or may not have been perineural infiltration, in other words, cancer growing down around nerves. They're all little bits about the architecture that allow us to make a punt about whether we think this tumour is going to behave in a good or bad fashion. So what does that mean? These are old figures um, and they're figures derived from before we used to do lots and lots of aggressive therapy, but they give you an idea of what it goes on about. So that if you've got organ-confined disease, your five-year survival at, uh, is 97%. Uh, it's a five-year risk of no disease progression, not just of survival, but of the disease not progressing is 97%, and 10 years, 84%. If you've got focal capsular penetration, it drops from 97 to 91. In other words, just a tiny little bit. But if you've got established, in other words, multiple areas, then it drops down to 78%. And of course, that doesn't apply these days with all the different types of therapies that people have as well. But it just shows you that it's really quite important if you can get the cancer in the prostate confined to the prostate, then you've got a much better chance of controlling the disease than if it's widely outside the prostate in the fibromuscular tissue. And if you can get around it, it's even more important. So extra prostatic extension with a negative margin, so there's the prostate, there's the cancer in the soft tissue, but the margin's out here somewhere, so the surgeon's got all around it. So that's going to give a much better prognosis when compared to this where the edge of the prostate's around about there, and then this piece of cancer is actually extending to the margins. So we know that there's actually cancer still in the wall of the pelvis, but they haven't been able to get around all of it. So, is there extra prostatic extension? Do we have a localized disease? 
potentially curable? If we have margin involvement, then is there local recurrence? Does the PSA again start to rise? Do we need to give additional radiotherapy to knock off those few cells around the edges of the prostate that the surgeon hasn't been able to get around? If there's a large area, then it may be we might need even hormone therapy. So those are the implications of that information in the, um, in the prostate. Uh, and of course, often these days, they'll take out a lymph node or some lymph nodes uh, associated with the, um, the prostate. And lymph nodes on the sections that we look at tend to be sort of uniform and blue and pinky. But there's a little bit up here that looks a bit different. And those little spaces are actually little glands of prostate cancer that have spread from the prostate to the lymph nodes. And you can do PSA markers on those and demonstrate that that's cancer manufacturing PSA that had gotten outside the prostate and had spread to the lymph nodes, which is why some people who have got low-grade cancer have the, the cancer operated on and the PSA still keeps rising because despite the fact that it was localised to the prostate initially, there are in fact some small deposits in the lymph nodes at the same time. So these days they'll either get radiotherapy or they may operate on the lymph nodes at the beginning depending on the, um, the grade of the cancer. So that's pretty much traditionally uh, what we've done for a long period of time. Um, but things are changing. Um, and the reason things are changing is that time's passing. Um, and you can't do the same thing that you've done all the time because our understanding of things change. And if you stay in the one spot and the sand shift around you, um, you can end up being sort of pretty useless um, because the whole land and everything has moved outside. So sometimes the lighthouse really isn't in the right spot anymore. So what we're trying to do these days is find out more information, find some of that information in different ways that is useful for a patient to make a, an assessment and a prognosis about how they're going to behave and how they're going to be treated, um, but also in the classification information. And I'm going to give you some information today that um, is not actually even published yet, but will be published later on this year, but is hopefully going to give you some more understanding of what we do and what prostate cancer is and what Gleason is. So where we're trying to get to is this is where we've been for quite a period of time. We've done a good job building houses and things, but we really want to get up to here and understand things as best we can upon the rock. And the reason this is all happening still is because prostate cancer is actually, our understanding of prostate cancer is a fairly young um, uh, career path, <laughs> shall we say. Um, it's a fairly new science from the point of view of, it was really only in the mid 80s that we started to find a way to get information about prostate cancer. We knew it was there, we knew people got it, we knew got cancer about it. But two things happened in the mid-1980s that changed the way we understand the disease. One was PSA came along. And PSA, even though it's variable and makes things very, very difficult, it does allow us to identify some people who are at risk and some who are not. The second thing that happened was that they invented the biopsy gun. So prior to that, the only way we could actually get tissue out of the prostate was to actually go in and resect part of the prostate um, using the chipping method for obstruction. But as I showed you from the picture, that you're actually, when you're doing that, you're actually just getting the middle bit, and the cancer's often actually in the outside. And the needle biopsy gun allowed for the first time safely to get material from that outside part of the prostate. And initially, as I say, it was always done through the rectum. And these days they can do it either through the rectum or they can actually do it through the skin of the perineum uh, just between the legs and go into the prostate from obliquely, anteriorly um, and get multiple different biopsies. Uh, when they first started doing it, you would get six cores, one on each side at different levels, upper, middle, lower. Um, these days we get 16 to 18 different locations where they'll do the biopsies and sometimes you'll get somewhere between 30 and up to, the, I think the highest I've had is 80 odd of prostates done on a particular patient at one period of time. I think that was a very large prostate and um, uh, it was almost a prostatectomy by default. Um, but these days, if you're going to do what they, you'll hear them talk about doing saturation biopsies, which is where you're trying to find young people with small but high grade cancers and identify them very quickly and early, they'll do multiple, multiple biopsies. And it takes the surgeon a certain amount of time to do the biopsies and it takes me just as long, if not longer, to actually look at each of the slides. It's a long day when they do multiple biopsies. One of the particular surgeons will send me 12 to 15 patients, each with 18 pots um, and 30 cores, and there's the day gone for me. Um, that's where the coffee comes in again. Coffee and a little bit of lunch. Uh, once we started to, um, to use those tools, 
our incidence of cancer went up because we found a whole bunch of cancers that wouldn't have presented until much later because we found them earlier in the process because we had new tools for identifying patients who had early cancer. And that's why there was a spike in the early 90s of the incidence of prostate cancer went up dramatically. It's come back down again. These are American figures. Uh, the bottom line is um, uh, white males and the top line is American males, uh, black males. The uh, Australian graph is rough, roughly in the middle. But the, the graphs around the world are all pretty much the same. Uh, that we've brought it back down. We found those original patients and now we're looking towards getting back to where the long-term trend line would be. But we're trying to find cancer at an earlier age where it's more treatable and therefore not just get the incident rate to drop but the death rate from cancer to drop. So that's the plan. Okay, so there are three main things that are going on from the point of view of shifting sands that I want to just mention uh, with you. Um, and the main one's the funny one at the end. Um, there's a lot of work going on at the moment in everything in medicine about uh, prog prognostic markers, uh, genetic prognostic markers. Uh, this follows on from the sequencing of the human DNA and a whole range of other things, knowing that how we do about the understanding of cancers and how they're all different. The second thing that's happened fairly recently, uh, and this is still evolving very rapidly, is magnetic resonance imaging, which is a great way of looking inside the body without actually using x-rays. It uses uh, vibrations in water molecules and magnetic resonance to actually make images. And then from from a pathologist's point of view, the other biggest change that's happening is our concept of the Gleason grade. And I'll tell you about the Gleason grade and what it is because it's the big thing that everybody talks about in prostate cancer. My Gleason score is six or seven or eight or nine. What does all that mean? And people have had a lot of trouble understanding that. So we're gonna make it easier for you. That's what we're, we're heading in the next, uh, next few months. Okay, from the point of view of prognostic markers, it's all about personalized medicine and personalized diagnoses. Now, prostate cancer is a few years behind our understanding of other diseases such as breast cancer. And the reason breast cancer was five to 10 years ahead of prostate cancer was because it's much more accessible. And people were getting tissues from breast cancers before they were able to get tissues from prostate cancer. And so they worked a lot of their stuff out in the 1980s and early 1990s, and we've been working our stuff out in the late 1990s up to about now. But what they've done with breast cancer is that they've been doing genetic profiling. And off the screen, on the left-hand side, is a huge list of different types of genes that everybody has. And each one of those lines, these things here, all these little lines of different colors, uh, represent a different gene that's mapped to a different patient. And so some people have light colors, some people have dark colors, and it means whether the gene's expressed or the gene's not expressed. And you can actually map a lot of breast cancers out into those different categories based upon the genes that are present in them. So uh, a piece of cancer will be taken from a breast and it'll be sent off for normal pathology, but you can also do genetic profiling on it. Now, there are several different tests around, the mammoprint, the prosigna, and the oncotype. And these have been around for a while, and they give different information to what a pathologist does. It's still very controversial because the trouble is no cancer has the same genetic marker as even the same prior to cancer in different patients. So two prostate cancers don't have the same genetic markers. They have different genetic markers. Everybody's different. Everybody's cancers are different. They tried it a few years ago in colon, and there was an Oncotype DX colon uh, that was released where they looked at gene abnormalities that may or may in fact predict whether you're going to have a bad prostate, a bad, bad colon cancer rather, bad colon cancer. And um, it hasn't really worked. Um, it doesn't give you any more information than just a pathologist looking down in the microscope and telling information. And just recently, they've started to roll out one for prostate cancer. Uh, it's very controversial. There's two others around now. There's an Oncotype DX, and there's a Polaris one, and then there's one called Decipher. And these are all different ways of looking at the genes that are in your cells, are in your cancer, and try to make predictions of how they're doing. And this is very much an evolving science. Looking down at microscopes has been around since the 1700s. We only got to react together really well in the 19, well, 1890s, 1920s sort of stuff, and then really only after that in the 1950s. This is all happening at the rate of weeks. Um, there's new information coming out, there's new publications coming out. It's all evolving very, very rapidly. At the moment, it's not reliable as a diagnostic tool. 
um, and it's a predictor tool, but it's starting to become used as a lot. And the theory is that you can in fact use it to identify people who for all intents and purposes have got identical cancers when you look down the prostate, but is there something in their genetic profile that says the guy on the left hand side doesn't need to be treated, whereas the guy on the right hand side, even though his cancer is very similar, does need to be treated. Unfortunately, um, these tests are still, as I say, almost in a research thing, particularly the, um, whoops, particularly um, the Decipher and Polaris. They haven't even really only just started to be introduced in Australia. Oncotype's been around for about 12 months now. Um, but because they're still research tools, you have to pay for them yourself. Like they're four and a half thousand dollars and the information that you get from them is still arguable. But it's the future. Um, there's a company in America that if you send your tumour to you, they'll do a complete human genome on that cancer and then they'll tell you every potential genetic abnormality that's present in that cancer and then they'll map it with known genetic abnormalities and some of those genetic abnormalities may or may not have drugs that we know work. So certain stomach tumours that we know that there's a particular drug that really does a great job on kicking, fixing that cancer because of a particular aspect of it. And the dream is that at some stage or other, one of these tests will evolve into that sort of information where we can say there's a particular abnormality, there's a particular drug just for you, personalised diagnosis and personalised medicine. It's not going to be around as a, a general thing for the long term, for, for a while yet I think, but it is around, it is starting to show um, potential. And the main potential benefits are that you can do two things. One, you can actually, if you know someone has a cancer on their genetics that's going to behave in a not too aggressive manner, you could say you don't have to do as many biopsies on them. Or more importantly, you could say they don't have to have a radical prostatectomy. You can afford to watch. And that's where a lot of the push in healthcare of prostate disease at the moment is trying to separate the people who have got really, really bad cancers and need unequivocally to be treated, and as opposed to those people who have got cancers that are really not that aggressive and patients can live with those cancers and die from something else entirely, running over by a bus, anything. Because we know that the prostate cancer will just sit there for 30, 40 years without doing things. The holy grail at the moment is to try to make that distinction. One of the ways we make that distinction is in grade, or Gleason grade, and I'll come back to that. Okay, so we've got the molecular thing. The other thing that we've got is magnetic resonance, resonance imaging. The average prostate looks like that on an MRI. That's the prostate, and this is the rectum. This is all the surrounding bits of tissue out here. And we talked about the different zones. That's the central or transitional zone, and this is the posterior peripheral zone, this slightly paler area out there. Now it looks very variegated in everybody. There's little brown areas, there's dark areas, there's light areas. But what they're trying to do with their MRI is to identify a discrete area of change. Now there's, they call it multi-parameter because they actually do four different types of scans looking at images, looking at blood flows and all that sort of stuff to give the overall impression. But basically what you're trying to do is compare that sort of patient there where it's all sort of pretty much the same to somebody like this where it's all pretty much the same along here and then you've got a hole, you've got a difference, you've got an abnormality. And if you can recognise that patient, then you can say, hey, there's a cancer there. Now the sand particularly is way ahead of the curve on this sort of thing at the moment. Uh, the radiologists here who I know quite a few of them, because I actually come here every fortnight uh, to a meeting where we sit around and discuss patients for a couple of hours. Um, they show the MRIs and I show the biopsies and the clinicians decide what to do with the patients. Um, the SAN's actually one of the leaders in their MRI. They're really, really good. They've got great machines and more importantly, they've got great people. Um, so it's actually a very, very strong positive thing here for the SAN. What they're trying to do is, like I said, separate the people into the different groups. They're trying to detect the significant cancers and not detect the insignificant cancers. They don't care if they don't detect the insignificant cancers. And we know that actually MRI is rubbish at detecting some types of prostate cancer. It doesn't detect the low grades and the Gleason's 3 plus 3 equals 6, which we'll come to a sec, or some of the even 3 plus 4s. It's really, really good at detecting the intermediate to high grades, the 4s and the 5s, the so 4 plus 4 equals 8 and the 4 plus 5 equals 9. If you can detect those high grade cancers, and you can't detect the low-grade cancers, which doesn't matter, then great. You can say a patient's got cancer, they've got low-grade cancer, which we've confirmed on biopsies, but they don't have any high-grade abnormalities on their MRI. 
And as long as their MRI doesn't change, we know they haven't developed any high-grade cancers. So the potential benefit, hopefully, for this is that, first of all, if there is an abnormality on the MRI, you've got to target that. Maybe instead of doing 80 biopsies, you could do two. Go straight into that area. We know that's probably going to be the highest area. You get less side effects, less chances of infection from the biopsies. More importantly, you can actually go longer between the biopsies. So say you need a biopsy every two years at the moment, where you can go five years or even longer if the MRI uh, doesn't change over a period of time. And therefore, you have less side effects from multiple, multiple biopsies. If you do need a surgical excision later on, if you've had lots and lots of biopsies over a long period of time, you, it is possible to get inflammation around the outside of the prostate. So we're trying to hopefully separate the patients. Now, at the moment, the MRI because it works in conjunction with the histopathologist, I'm biased, but the MRI is giving better information and allowing us to sort people into good and bad groups. It's not perfect, and it does miss, there's a particular pattern of one high-grade cancer that it's very bad at identifying, and they miss that one all the time, and the pathologist needs to identify that. So it's not a magic answer yet, but it is part of the way that we're looking now at getting tissue to the microscope and be able to make information, and it is going to be a game changer, I think, over a period of time. Okay, now the third big thing is Gleason grading. I'm going to spend the rest of the time that we've got on Gleason grading from different aspects of it so that you understand what I'm talking about and more importantly, you'll go away being able to Gleason grade people's biopsies. Yes, you will. You'll be cool. You're going to get a little prize and everything. Okay, so what is grading? We talked before about variation from normal, okay? So that if you vary from normal, then the bigger the variation, the more abnormal the cells are. And basically when you're doing a grading, and it's just the word that pathologists use, when you're doing a grading, you're trying to put some sort of number on that variation. And if the variation is small, then it's only a small variation, then it's a low grade change. And if it's an intermediate or a big change, then it's a high grade change. And high grade changes are bad because we talked about the variation before and low-grade changes are not as bad. So I'm looking at appearance down the microscope and making a prediction of behavior. Now, the good thing about Gleason grading is it's been around for about 30 years now, and it's well-established, and it's actually quite a simple system because it uses architecture and it uses pattern recognition. So you can actually make the diagnosis without actually having to go into really, really detailed on the microscope. You look at it, you draw lines around patterns. So, what do I mean when I say we're going to do pattern recognition? It means I'm looking down the microscope at shapes and colors, and I'm going to assess the things. Okay, so the next things I'm going to show you are all bits of prostate in some form or other. But see if you can recognize patterns that are a bit different. Yes, it's a koala bear. Thank you very much. Yes, it's a koala bear. Uh, it's actually a prostate gland with a few little bits of pro protein in the middle of it, okay? But if you look down a microscope, you can see patterns. You can recognize patterns, okay? I have my heart in my job. And you can see the heart in the prostate sometimes. And some of the hearts are big hearts. Some of them are a little bit smaller hearts. But you can recognize hearts. Is that a happy face or a sad face? I have arguments about this. That one's a scary face. I reckon that one's scary. Whereas that one's sort of happy. I think he's sort of trying to smile. Happy face. Okay, scary face. Okay, this next one's not doctored. It's a blood vessel. Um, I do have another one which someone just sent me recently that does have New Zealand in it. Um, so I'll, I'll have to pop that one in there. Okay. The next one, pattern recognition, what's the first thing that pops into your head? And then what's he doing? He's laying the golden egg, yes, see? So there's his leg that he's laying. Okay, and we can get festive sometimes. That's the prostate Christmas reindeer. And that's a benign gland just branched because the glands go off in all sorts of different directions um, but they form shapes and they form patterns and those patterns are normal 
and sometimes you see strange things. My son works in digital media and advertising, and he's, he's all into blogs and all that sort of stuff. He says you should have a blog of weird prostate stuff, um, things you see down the prostate. Um, but I still think the range is the best one. Um, but you can also do the same thing when you're talking about cancer glands. So you know what the prostate's supposed to look like, allowing for all these sort of weirdo variations. If it's going to change, how does it change, and what does that change mean? And that's where Gleason comes in. So Gleason is based upon the architectural changes. How does the gland in the prostate evolve over a period of time? And what Gleason was clever to, dis to, dis dis to realize was that within the prostate there can be multiple changes all at one period of time. And what he did was he came up with a recognition that there were actually five different patterns. And he called them one, two, three, four, five. Okay, he was a pathologist. And it's a relatively simple system that's masked in the complexity of those numbers. Because what he did was he took the two most dominant patterns and he added them together. So we started off with Gleason grades, these things, and he gave them numbers of one to five. But he said because there's multiple patterns around, we'll add them together, the two most dominant ones, to give you a Gleason score. So the grade goes 1 to 5, the Gleason score goes 2 to 10. So you can have 1 plus 1, 3 plus 4, 5 plus 3, those sort of things. You get a whole bunch of different numbers all mixed together to give you a prognosis. And the bottom line was basically the closer your number was to 10, the worse the cancer was. And the lower the number, the better the cancer was. Okay, so that's pretty much how we started off and we have seen shifting sands quite dramatically over the years. So this was his original diagram of what his patterns of cancer looked like. There were five different categories and some of the categories were actually quite complex and it was difficult to be able to make the distinction sometimes between a three and a four. Now he was working on material before the needle biopsies, we're talking mid 70s, and he was working on a couple of thousand cases. I think his biggest series eventually was about three and a half thousand cases. Now over in the States at the moment, um, places like Baltimore um, and MD Anderson and Sloan Kettering in New York are doing thousands of cases every year. And they're publishing huge big series. series. Douglas Handy Moy Pathology, my unit, we report about 1,700 radical prostatectomies a year, uh, which is about 40% of the state's radical prostates come through my unit. Um, so we develop a huge understanding now that Gleason didn't have. And so what happens every few years, a whole bunch of pathologists gets together, which is a really wild party, a bunch of pathologists together. Um, and it's called the International Society of Urological Pathology. And we sit around and have parties and whatever, and we argue about Gleason. And in 2005, we changed the way the, gra the, the chart looked. So it looked from that to this sort of chart, which was easier, and then a bunch of them got together in 2010, did very naughtily, just changed a little bit on their own and then published this sort of diagram. Um, this has been updated and at a meeting uh, just before Christmas last year, this diagram was confirmed and something new was added to it, which is what I'm going to tell you about. But let's just look at the diagram. Think of a donut and that's basically your prostate gland. It's a round thing with a hole in the middle and that's what they look like when they're well behaved, when they're low grade cancers, they just look like a little bunch of donuts. And if they're well behaved donuts, they all sit together and they just sit there. So low grade cancer really grows very slowly by a little bit of expansion, and that's called grade one. Grade two is the same sort of donutty things, but they're getting a little bit apart. So they're in a box and they're sort of being shaken and they come apart a little bit as opposed to in a bag before. So this is the cancer picture here of a grade two and they're starting to spread a little bit. In grade three, which is the mid-range of the pattern of the donuts, the donuts now have separated from each other. And they're actually wandering. Instead of sitting together as a group, those donuts will spread into different parts of the glands as an infiltrative pattern. In other words, cancers spread within the glands. But they'll still maintain their general architecture, sometimes a bit funny shaped donut, but basically there'll be a thing around the outside with a hole in the middle. Now, if they go beyond that, and they go to a Gleason grade four, then the donuts get squashed together. And instead of looking like a donut, they start to look like Swiss cheese. So you've got a chunk of something or other with holes in it. 
and that means that the glands are not actually making the normal structures that they used to, they're getting confused, the architecture is starting to break down. And if the architecture breaks down entirely, then they don't bother the form glands at all, and you just get solid masses of cells, and all those cells are doing is growing and destroying surrounding tissue, and that's when you get a high-grade cancer because it's stopped doing anything else. And paradoxically, your PSA can be really low because the cells aren't making PSA anymore. They're basically just switched on. All they want to do is grow, grow and destroy. So one to five donuts through to nothing going on. And what Gleason did was he put them into groups. And he basically said, if you got a score of one plus one or two plus two or even two plus three, then your score was less than five or five. And that was a good group. The three plus three equals six was the middle group. 3 plus 4 equals 7 is the sort of intermediate group going up to becoming fairly aggressive and 8 and 9 were the high-grade cancers, 4 plus 4 and the 4 plus 5. And on the original papers you could look at all these sort of things and say basically what's the chance of progression and it really you don't get much progression until you get into the 7, 8s, 9s and 10s in these sort of graph. But what we've learned over a period of time is that the twos and the threes really aren't doing much at all. In fact, the two plus two equals four. Those cancers don't grow. You'll find them in an autopsy. They just sit in the prostate. They're not doing anything. And so paradoxically, we got a situation where we stopped labeling those sort of cancers because we knew they weren't significant. And we started to group them in amongst the three plus threes. So suddenly, the, middle, the, the lowest cancer you could have was suddenly three plus three equals six. And everybody's saying, well, if I've got a cancer six, why is that a good cancer? Why is that not an intermediate cancer? Because in Gleason's original paper, it was an intermediate cancer. But what we found is that, strictly speaking, based upon the modifications that have been done to Gleason, mainly in 2005, and the way we report things, those cancers don't kill you if they don't change from three plus three equals six. They can grow, and they will, can spread outside the prostate but they rarely and probably never spread to your lymph nodes and spread to your other organs. You've got to have four or five in your cancer before it can spread. And how much of it you can have depends upon how the prognosis is going to be. So three plus three equals six, then becomes three plus four equals seven, four plus three equals seven, four plus four equals eight, and four plus five equals nine in the groups. What happened to the three plus four equals seven and the four plus three? Why do we need those? Well. There's a thing called the Will Rogers phenomenon. And Will Rogers was a comedian in the 50s and 60s in America. And he was famous for saying that when the Okies, the Oklahomans, when the Okies left Oklahoma and moved to California, they raised the average intelligence of both states. <laughs> Nobody's from California? Okay. It's actually much more insulting for the Californians. But anyway, so if we look at the Will Rogers phenomenon in the point of view of prostate cancer, this is how our understanding of things have changed. So if you've got an arrow with prognosis, and at the top of the arrow you've got a good prognosis, and down the bottom you've got a bad prognosis group, then you can actually put patients into those categories of six, seven, and eight to decide how their prognosis is going to be. So if you put all the patients there that have got three plus three equals six, and then you put all the patients there that have got three plus four equals seven, and then the four plus four equals eights, you can see that their prognoses on the spectrum will be different. So the three plus three equals six people got a yellow prognosis, they do quite well. But we've now changed the way we classify Gleason and we've started to understand it more and we've started to break it down. So what we did is we took a bunch of the three plus threes equals six and we reclassified them and we called some of those grade four. Instead, we modified the Gleason diagram so a little bit of the three plus three equals six move from one column across to the other side. And of course, what that meant was that the three plus three group was actually smaller. And so the prognosis moves up and they're actually got a better prognosis now, that whole group, than the original group. So the original group was here. And now we've got a smaller three plus three equals six because we've defined it more rigidly. And we've actually narrowed it right down so they actually got a really, really good prognosis, that, that particular group. But you've now got this big, chunky bit in the middle, that's seven. So what we have to do now is look at the proportions of four and five that are present there and make a prediction 
they make, it, make an assessment of whether there's 3 plus 4 or 4 plus 3, depending whether it's 50% or 60% or whatever. And if you do that, you can split off the 3 plus 4 from the 4 plus 3 because the prognosis at the moment is sitting right there in the middle. But if you move the 8s out of the way for a moment and then you take the 3 plus 4s and the 4 plus 3s separate and you move the 4 plus 3s across to the right hand side, you've now got a fourth group. And the prognoses for those four groups are now all different. So there's the prognosis for the 3 plus 3s. This was your old category 7 prognosis, but now you've got a good group above that with 3 plus 4, and you've got another group down here with a, bad, with a worse bad prognosis, with a worse prognosis, and they're the 4 plus 3s, and then you've still got the 4 plus 4 equals 8s down here. So by understanding the disease, by doing more and more subclassification, we're able to sort the patients better and to actually make a better prognosis and a prediction of how that's going to work. But we're still stuck with this weirdo terminology. 3 plus 3 equals 6, 3 plus 4, whatever. Okay, we're not going to change what we do there. The pathologist will always do that in the background. But what we're now going to do is going to introduce a different term. And most of Australia hasn't heard about this yet, so you're pretty new on the loop for this. And the International Society of Urological Pathology is going to make up its own thing called the prognostic grade or the prognostic index. So in the future, whilst there'll still be Gleason going on and the Gleason grades will be in the report, if you've got a carcinoma that is a 3 plus 3 equals 6, it will be an ISIP nuclear, uh, an ISIP prognostic grade 1 cancer. So if you've got a grade 1 cancer, the chances are that you will die with that cancer and you'll do very well and you don't need aggressive therapy. And those sort of patients can be the ones who've got negative MRIs and they don't need radical prostatectomies unless there's some sort of change occurs. Prognostic grade two will replace three plus four equals seven. Grade three is the four plus three is equal seven. Fours is the four plus four is equals eight. And fives are the nines and the tens. They're all pretty much the same. They're a bad thing. So the International Society of Urological Pathology, the ISUP, which is a horrible acronym, ISUP, um, new grading system will be one to five and the low-grade cancels will be one, and the high-grade cancels will be number five. What does actually that mean? Well, what it means is that if you're in a different group, you're going to have a different prognosis. So the different lines represent the different categories, and this is your chance of not having progression of cancer. In other words, if you've got a low-grade cancer, then your chances of the disease progressing after a radical prostatectomy characterized by a rise in your PSA. We're not talking about death rates, we're just talking about progression of cancer. If you've got a 3 plus 3 equals 6, then very few of those patients over a 10 year period will have any sort of progression from their cancer. You know, some of them will, but the majority of them will have a pretty flat curve. If you've got a 3 plus 4 equals 7, then about 10, 15% over 10 years may develop a rising PSA because of a bit of tumor that's spread outside the prostate or maybe occasional lymph node. Once you go from 3 plus 4 to 4 plus 3, the graphs start to separate. And this will be the new category for 3. This will be the new category 4. And as you can see, the category 5 patients, if you've got a 4 plus 5 equals 9 cancer, then the chances of you getting to 10 years without any other therapy after your radical prostatectomy, without having a rise, a rise in your PSA, is only about 25%. So the other 75% with those high-grade cancers are going to need radiotherapy and hormones. We're not talking about people dying because that's a whole different thing. Um, but we're talking about whether the, what the biology of the disease is and whether the disease might progress. So I think it's going to be a newer system. I hope it's not too confusing, um, but it actually will, I think, clarify the situation and you can understand the progression better than all those silly sort of numbers. Okay, so in the last couple of minutes, because we're just about run out of time and I apologise for spending too much time talking, um, I'm going to show you a bunch of cases and this is where you're going to be quizzed. Okay, so you're going to call out the numbers and you can either give the Gleason score or you can give the ISOP number. I don't mind if you're really cool, you can give the ISOP number. So let's start with one of them. These are all prostate cancers and most of them will have a variation on the slide. So remember the donuts? Nice little round donuts is good. Donuts squashed together in cheese is not so good and no donuts at all is really, really bad. Now this one, you can see that there are donuts sort of down here, and over here there aren't any donuts. So this one represents grade three and grade four, 
giving you 3 plus 4 equals 7, which is the new ISOP grade 2, which is a significant cancer and needs to be treated. Okay? Got all that? First one's easy. Okay, this one. There's the cancer in the middle. And it's characterized by all these little donuts. Oh, the one thing I forgot to tell you. If Gleason's only got one pattern in it, you just double the number. So there's only grade three. They used to call it three plus three equals six, which is what three plus three equals six was. If you only had grade four, it was four plus four equals eight. So if you look down the microscope and you only see one pattern, you give that a grade and then you just double it. So there's only one grade here. There's only one pattern. Anybody want to have a punt? They're a bit squashy donuts, but they're basically donuts. So that's 3 plus 3 equals 6. And that's the one you want to have. That's the good cancer. Now that's the grade 1, the new ISOP grading. OK. Up here, we've got some squashed together donuts. And then we've got some little dotty cells here. And the same sort of thing here. Not a lot of donuts at all going on. So that's going to be 4 and 5 and that's going to be an ISOP grade 5. That's what the bad cancer looks like. It's not forming any donuts at all. It's just all squashed, mucky things. OK. Next one. Two different areas. You've got an area down here of nice regular donuts. That's a blood vessel over the side. Ignore the blood vessel. And then you've got a bigger area up here. Down here we've got round things like donuts with holes in the middle. Up here we haven't got. And don't forget, when you're looking at Gleason, you're looking at the portions. So this one's bigger, and this one's smaller. So that would be your first number, and that would be your second number. So... 4 plus 3. Okay, that's the grade 3 down there, and that's the grade 4. So that's 4 plus 3, that's the new category we split off, so that's going to be ISO category 3. It's almost this easy. No, it's not really. Otherwise, I'd be out of a job. But it's, it's not, you know, it's pattern recognition. It's pretty good. It's like reindeers. Now, this one's a tricky one because this is the one that we've gotten rid of. So here, I've showed you this photograph. This is actually a localized area of good donuts. You can see the donuts, and they're all just sitting together in a nice, neat category. And this is what we used to call 2 plus 2 equals 4. And that's now all grouped together basically in 3 plus 3 equals 6. So everything 6 and below is now clustered together. And so that's ISOP category 1. So that's a really, really good type thing to have. OK, just a few more to go. Not many donuts there. There's some down here in this sort of region. And then over here, you've got a few holes, but really not that many. That one's actually controversial because the way it's actually orientated, you could, could say it's 4 plus 3 instead of 3 plus 4 and make it an ISOP category, um, uh, category 3. And that was, this is actually, this particular one's from, uh, from the ISOP um, publication of 2005, and I disagree with it. Uh, and strictly speaking, I'd call that 4 plus 3 rather than 3 plus 4. So here we're changing everything today. OK, a couple more. Big, solid chunks, no donuts at all just solid bits of cells with holes in them, but there's really no donuts going on. But that pattern is pretty much the same as that pattern, just solid squashed together type cheese, which makes it a 4 plus 4 equals 8, which is a nice category 4. OK, three more. That's very similar to the last one I showed you. This one down here is just little dots, individual cells. So that's bad and that's really bad. So what were the really bad numbers? They were 4 and 5. So that's grade 4, that's grade 5, 4 plus 5 equals 9, and there's a new ISOP category 5. So that's bad cancer. If you've got ISOP 5, you're going to need some aggressive therapy fairly soon, please. Lots of little round dots, uh, lots of little round donuts. These are all donuts. There's only one pattern here. That's the hint. Yep. So it's 3 plus 3 equals 6. The old 2s, the old 3s, all grouped together. ISOP, grade 1. OK, the last one. The last one's a bit tricky, because I, I said there's lots of different patterns in amongst Gleason that you need to recognize. Um, but we've got these large, big, chunky bits of cheese-type uh, um, cheese pattern with holes in the middle of it. 
And then in amongst all this stuff, there is little dots, little tumor cells all the way around there. There's more cancer down there. So that's four plus five equals nine, isop category five. Okay, so I hope that wasn't too painful for you. Um, pathology is difficult. It's an unusual thing. Um, it's sort of outside the range of what most people think about as, um, as medicine, but it's, it's good. Um, change is good. We're learning more. Um, we're giving you more information now, and we're giving you more information that you can use to make decisions and to understand and therefore plan in the future because hopefully that's where we're all going to end up in an uplifting sort of way. So I thank you very much for your attention. Do we have any questions, please? Oh, I have one. If, if you have a three plus three under the old system, yes. so you could be a really a three plus four now. Yes, yeah. Um, based upon the changes in 2005, uh, some of the features in Gleason's original diagram have been moved, as I said, from the three plus three equals six column into the three plus four equals seven. Um, and so if you go back to the 1990s, you have to reassess some of the Gleason scores. And that's one of the things we do in research. We go back and look at the really, really old ones. Um, it doesn't just date, however, from 2005 because the, the papers that that change was based upon had been coming out for the last 10 or 12 years prior to that. So we're onto it in the 90s. Um, and most of the big units, and certainly my unit, um, had switched over well before 2005. And we were making comments in the reports that saying, this is different because of X, Y, and Z. Uh, but certainly for the last uh, 10 uh, to 15 years, there's really no need to change it. But yes, there has been a, a prognostic shift, and the people with 3 plus 3 equals 6 now are in a very good category, whereas before they were a mixed group. Mm. Are, the, are the results on the slides kept for any time? Like um, I know in the SAN, when they had it, they had an older building down here that they had stores and stores and stores of slides. Yeah. The government requires us to keep them for seven to eight years, unequivocally. Um, Douglas Haney Moyer, we retain things for about 10 or 12 years. Uh, beyond that, then all we've got is electronic reports. We can't go back mm -hmm. and look at the slides. Uh, the paraffin block tends to go off a bit. Um, and as you can imagine, the number of slides these days, uh, warehouses are very, very full. Yes. And they need to be on the ground floor because that much glass is really, really heavy. Um, so yeah, we have a very large warehouse out the back of where our main lab is, um, where we store all this sort of stuff. They've got two warehouses. Um, but we can keep everything for 10 to 12 years. And the reason that's important is these days we're going back and doing molecular analysis on a lot of breast cancers and melanomas and gastric cancers to doing tests that we couldn't do at the time to give us more information. Um, so we always try and hold everything unequivocally for at least a decade. Mm. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, after the uh, radical prostatectomy, um, and, and there is a continuation because the Gleason the still carries PSA. on the PSA a little bit, there's nothing that you can do from the histopathological side to tell where it is or how it is or anything like that, is there? Yeah, like when the thing came back it showed that it had escaped a bit and probably up towards the bladder of it and we've had radiotherapy since then but um, there's nothing from a, your side that you can tell anywhere where it might be or how or anything like that is there? Mm, yes and no. Um, depending on whether there's positive margins or not then you can say well the positive margins on the right hand side up on the top left hand corner or somewhere on the left hand side on the bottom right or something like that you know, can actually give a, a, a reference point um, but everything changes once you start operating and things move around so it's actually quite difficult um, there's a couple of other things that i didn't mention in the talk that are also other aspects of um, shifting sands that are actually not my um, area that i didn't want to go on too much about them one of them is a thing called a psma scan um, and these are nuclear medicine scans. And nuclear medicine is a different way of um, identifying things. And just as I was able to document PSA being manufactured in cells, um, PSMA has only really come on board in the last 12 months. Um, and there's now um, the main unit doing this at the moment is St. Vincent's. 
Um, they're doing a big research trial to work out how good it is. But basically you can do a nuclear medicine scan and they're down to three or four millimetres that they can document where there's cancer. That's probably PSA relating type cancer. Um, and if you can do that, then they can target it very, very, very accurately with the radiation therapy. Um, so that is also coming. Um, and I think the research they're doing, they've been doing comparing several different different types of markers as well as the PSMA and it's showing good thing. There's a few that it does miss um, and again it's like MRIs that not all prostate cancers are the same and so the markers aren't exactly the same. But that's the best way we've got these days. The best thing that they do after that is they then go in and they do a biopsy of that area to confirm that it's prostate cancer because you can get different cancers and you can get new cancers in addition to prostate cancer. Um, particularly um, people of the mature age um, can sometimes hit other different cancers and so you want to make sure you're treating the same sort of cancer. So fortunately for me there's always going to be a need for someone to actually look down the microscope at the biopsy so I'm not going to be without of a job for the time being anyway. Thank you. Yo. Do you know what proportion of um, biopsies now are done perineally? Um, no. Quite a lot, but it depends upon the clinical situation. Um, the transrectal ones are easier to do, um, and they, but they have an incidence of infection uh, and those sort of things that need to be done, but they can be done very, very quickly and easily. Um, the transperineal ones sample different parts of the prostate, but if you do it right, they can actually map out the whole prostate. So at the moment what they're tending to do is do transrectals for the simple cases to work up patients and if they need to do some serial mapping, whatever, then they'll do transperineals. There's a few units that do nothing but transperineals now. Uh, and I suspect within a few years, uh, at the moment, it, uh, I'm making up a figure, but at the moment it's probably 25% maybe. And I suspect it'll switch around the other direction in a few more years. Yeah, my reason for asking is that I had two biopsies done. The second one just about killed me, and I got very sick after the first one. Uh, and the uh, the reason for the second illness was to do with a, uh, a type of uh, E. coli, mm. uh, and I needed uh, what's it called a carbapenem, in fact, to kill it off. Uh, I wonder, is there a case for? Um, and this may not be utterly your specialty, but certainly the. Uh, uh, the part of the process would be uh, pathological, and that is, uh, is there a case for sampling um, the gut contents before just to see what bacteria are present, uh, or at least the, uh, uh, mm. you know, some, some part of the bowel anyway, to see what bacteria are present before someone even attempts or even thinks about yeah. uh, the, uh, the anal approach? The trouble is the rectum's full of all sorts of strange things. Um, and you can only take one or two organisms and you may not get it on a culture. Um, most of the times they'll do antibiotic cover um, these days and they'll usually prep a patient fairly carefully, similar to what a gastroenterologist will prep somebody. The alternate part of the spectrum is that nothing is safe in medicine once you start sticking needles into somebody. And you also get some really weird things. We've got a transperineal biopsy on our files. Um, and it was an elderly patient who'd been living at his home for quite a while, and perhaps claiming this wasn't his most spot-on type thing. But on the end of the needle biopsy of the prostate, which they did transparently, you can see that there's a leg and half a body of a little mite that was on the skin. He had sort of scaby type things that were running around on his skin. And when they did the needle biopsy, they went straight through this poor bug. So the, the prostate cause got this squashed bug on the end of it. So, Transperineal is, is probably cleaner, um, but there's even little things that get into it from the point of view of the transperineal uh, situation. Um, there are some different effects depending how, um, how many nerves are in different locations. Some people get erectile dysfunctions even after the biopsies. Uh, so there's a whole range of type things like that. The main thing that you could possibly, what we're trying to do, is to get the number of biopsies down. And that seems to be the way we're going, hopefully, with MRIs. If you can actually identify an area, then maybe you can do a, just do a targeted biopsy that get an unequivocal diagnosis. If that's not enough, then you can go back and do the saturation biopsies. Or maybe you could do the saturation biopsies to start off with and then just do a targeted biopsy rather than have multiple biopsies and rather have two sets of biopsies. You could just have one very quick, simple core in and out through the skin for the second one if you needed it later on if your cancer evolved. So, yeah, there have 
there's even been some deaths I know of overseas for people from, from prostate biopsy cancer, the actual procedures of diagnosis. So um, anything you do in medicine has a risk. Walking into a hospital has a risk. You trip over a bucket sort of thing, you know. I'd been to China not long before, and that may not have been helpful. Ah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Depends where your rectum's been hanging out. That's true, yes. Or what's been coming into it. Yes, exactly. The curry or not. Or India or whatever.